Okay, we back again as usual. I know these classes right now is coming kind of quick and they're gonna start doing that because again, my schedule has changed. Praise y'all, got more time off. <clears throat> so I'm able to do these things. So I'm gonna be putting them up here. And so you guys just get, get to them at your own leisure. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with this here. Uh, I don't know, I might do another one right after this one. We're going to look at uh, uh, the next phase of this, um, which is going to be um, oils and frankincense. It's very important. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with this thing. Abdiahu, uh, we come before you, Father, as always, asking for mercy, asking you forgive us for our uh, sin transgressions and uh, um, iniquity. Uh, we also ask, Father, that you just remember us with your mercy and your kindness. We thank you for all your benefits, Father, the air that we breathe, the eyes that we are have to see, the fresh air, the, uh, just, just being alive, Father, having food and raiment. We know without you, Father, that none of these things is possible. Whatever job you decided to give us, Father, we thank you for that. Because we know whether it's uh, whatever job it is, Father, we know that it's always going to be enough. And Father, we thank you for never uh, leaving us lonely and never, uh, we've, we've never lacked anything, Father, since we served you. Nothing. And no matter what's been going on in this world, Father, we, we never lacked anything. We never had to go ask anybody for anything. You have always provided for us, Father. We praise and magnify your name for that. Uh, that's a big deal to us. We realize, Father, without you that no, nothing is possible. Father, as we get ready to study this class, Father, we ask that you just open our eyes and our ears so that we can hear, see, and understand, and really understand how important uh, your word is, no matter what it is, no matter what the topic is, we know we need to understand it at a soul or side level um, so we can glean from it, Father, and that it will help us with our walk to try to get closer to you and try to walk in your will. And we thank you for these things, Father. We praise and magnify the name of Yahuwah, but there is no name greater. We thank you for all things, Father. We praise you always. And we thank you for the mighty Ruach HaKodesh. We ask that she be in a mess with us today. We also, Father, always thank you for your ultimate love gift. The burnt offering, peace offering. Yahuwah, Yahusha, Hamashiach. <laughs> thank you, Ab Yahuwah. In Yahusha's name, we ask these things, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, let's go ahead and get started with this here. This section is gonna be, we're gonna jump right into this thing. And it's not gonna be a long class. I think what I'm, uh, I don't know. I know it's the spirit who's been trying to tell me, it's put in my mind how to do these classes, this next series. So they're not gonna be no real long classes. They're gonna be a, a whole bunch of little small, tiny classes on each subject, on each offering. So that's, I'm, cause I'm trying to make it, this right here cause sometimes can be a little complicated could be a little bit mysterious, especially for those that really haven't been really studying these, this part of the book. And um, but that's why we're trying to give you this priesthood. Because again, like the last class, we showed you how relevant all of this stuff is, especially when you try to get to the, to the new covenant or under the, the renewed covenant or what they call the New Testament. When you're dealing with the Mashiach, when you're dealing with Paul, when you're dealing with the apostles, you mean, you know, you have to understand these things. Even when you get in the book of Revelation, you're going to see a lot of this stuff in it because this is what it's all about. It's all about the Father's house. It's all about those that, that, that keep the Father's house and minister to him. You know what I mean? Now and later on in the future, because you're going to have Zadok and his sons are going to be directly ministering to him. We're trying to show you these things. So even when you get to like in Ezekiel, I think it's 43, 44, uh, when it starts talking about the punishment of the Levites that went astray from him. 
you know, what their job is going to be. And you're going to see what Zadok's uh, job is going to be. It's going to be a temple there, not this temple they keep telling you about that these imposters want to put up. You know what I'm saying? This is going to be the temple in the new millennium. So it's, it's going to be really important because unless this stuff never goes away, we got to realize that. I mean, it's, it's not here now, but it's coming. It's coming with all the things that's going on right now. We should be able to understand that with all the things that's going on right now. And then actually, I'm going to, I got some classes I'm going to put together on a lot of this prophecy. So y'all have a better understanding of it. But see, with me, I understand it, but I have to try to go over it and over it and, and get every source I can glean from everywhere I possibly can. In other words, the truth, not anything crazy, because when I present it to you, I want to make it as simple and easy as possible. Not saying that you guys are not smart, because I know a lot of you are probably, most of y'all probably more intelligent than me. But the fact is, you know, you always want to make it as plain as possible. So because you might have somebody that doesn't know anything about the Ruach. They don't, they don't have any Ruach. So you, you want to make it as simple for them as you possibly can, you know, to help them discern. So again, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Understanding Offerings Part 3, Olive Oil and Frankincense. So let's get, let's get going. Now, oil in the Bible or oil in the biblical revelation refers primarily to olive oil, not petroleum deposits. Uses of olive of oil, I mean, uses of oil were for food, but importantly for light, oil lamps as in the temple. Exodus 27, verse 20 through 21. Consecration of the priests, Leviticus 8 and 30. And for healing as a ritual invocation of Elohim's touch. Leviticus 14, 1 through 18. All right, James 5 and 14. Olive oil has some medicinal properties that fit with the metaphorical usage and anointing for healing. All right, so again, uh, we need to understand that very important. And uh, again, if you have, you just happen to pop up here um, and haven't been uh, done the first two classes, a lot of these uh, uh, sayings, or uh, I guess you call them excerpts or whatever, coming from the Eternal uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, uh, 1939 edition. So, um, and I'm, I might be a little bit uh, off today. Well, yeah, I know I'd be up at three or four o'clock in the morning doing these classes. So, I mean, sometimes I'm sharp, sometimes I'm not, I'm tired, but I don't care. That spirit won't leave me alone. <laughs> it just keeps popping on my mind. So, okay, fine. I'll go ahead and do the class. I don't have no problem with it. I love doing this anyway. So I'm always going to try to get the best that I can. All right. Praise Yah. And magnify his name. Among the more than 200 times that oil is mentioned in the Bible, the connection as a metaphor of the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh's presence and action is clear in the ritual of anointing prophets, priests, and kings, right? Because they have to, you know, we, we know prophets was filled with the spirit. Priests, right? I mean, kings, they had, had, to have, had to have a copy of this word by them and all the time, and they was anointed. And we're going to show you the differences in that. You're going to see the Mashiach in a lot of this. And we're going to show you that. We're going to show you that. We're going to show and prove, like I used to say back in the 80s when we were dealing with the five percenters. What's the mathematics? What's today's mathematics? Yeah. But uh, so let's keep rolling. Now, breads and oils equals the Mashiach and the Ruach. And thou shalt, uh, Exodus chapter 27, 27 and 20, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil out of beaten for the light to cause a lamp to burn always, right? So they're talking about uh, the uh, menorah that was inside the temple. Let's go to Psalms 24. So Psalms 24, we're gonna look at that our king, see how powerful he is. You know what I mean? So, and this is going to make sense, this scripture right here, uh, especially when, <clears throat> when we get to talking about first fruits, because we know first fruits is um, a feast, right? But it's also 
an offering. Very important to understand. Now let's look at this. Verse uh, chapter one, uh, chapter 24, Psalms chapter 24, and verse one. The earth is Yahuwah's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of Yahuwah? Or who shall stand in his holy place, right? Because we all want to end up going to the hill of Yahuwah, right? We want to do that. We want to go to Zion, right? Or who shall stand in the holy place? Well, we know Zadok and his sons and the Mashiach are going to be able to do that. He that hath clean hands and pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So we're going to be able to do some of these things too. If we have clean hands, like we learned in the last, the, the last class, pure mind, who has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from Yahuwah and righteousness from the Elohim of his salvation. See, so we want to have that. We definitely want that. We want the blessings from Yahuwah, right? And then we definitely want the righteousness because that's going to that's gonna point us in the right way with the Torah and show us how to keep his commandments, walking on the path. And then we do that. Guess what? We keep in his will. Verse six, this is the generation of them that seek him and that seek that face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be ye lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? Yahuwah, strong and mighty. Yahuwah, mighty in battle, right? The greatest warrior to ever, that you could ever think of. Lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? Yahuwah of hosts, he is the clean king of glory, right? Uh, we could say Yahuwah of Sabaoth. So we know this is talking about the sun. But we're gonna keep rolling now. Now, Ruach has already moved and always moved in scripture. For example, when the prophet Judge Samuel anointed David with oil to be the new king of Israel, the next statement is that the spirit of Yahuwah came mightily upon David from that day forward, 1 Samuel 16 and 13. After David, the spirit of Elohim also gifted Solomon with great wisdom, a natural connection with being anointed as king. Unfortunately, being anointed by the spirit did not prevent Samson, because we know he was disobedient. Saul, we know he didn't have no faith. Uh, uh, Dawid, well, I mean, he, 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 I mean, he fell into the trap of lust, or was Solomon from failing in many ways, right? But Solomon, he went after many women, started worshiping other Elohim. So just because we, we receive the spirit, right, we have to do the things that it takes to keep the spirit. And we always have to check ourselves. And how we do that is with fasting and praying. And I mean, trust me, fasting is not an easy thing. I struggle with it sometimes myself, you know, and I'm praying too, you know. I mean, but I just try to get keep myself in a, in, a, in a ritual. You know, when I get up, that's the first thing I want to do. When I get home, that's the first thing I want to do. If I can do it at work where I'm at right now, I mean, I can, I try to do that too. They have, I just don't like going in, a, they have a, a room for Muslims. But that's so I really don't, they be, they praying. And so I really don't want to go in there and pray, you know? So it is what it is. Now let's keep rolling. The repeated emphasis on Hamashiach as the anointed one, Mashiach and Christos, right? Like people say, they'll say Jesus Christ, right? They don't know, they think that's his name. Like Jesus is the first name, Christ is the last name. No, it just means Yah Yah Yahusha, right? Uh, the savior of Yah, the anointed one. That's basically what it means. That's why we say Yahoo Shah, right? Because Yahoo is in, is, is in the name. We know that's is it just saying Yahoo is saved. Shah means saved, right? Uh, Mashiach and crystals both mean anointing. Plays on the metaphor of oil for the intense presence and action of the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh. This connection seems clear. And two examples where the spirit's presence is told in the terms of anointing with oil in relation to the Messiah. We, we will see, we'll show this later on now. So we, when we look at this word, um, when it says that he point poured like the anointing oil uh, on him, you're gonna see strong number four, eight, eight, eight masha, masha, right? Consecrated portion, anointing oil portion, ointment, anointing portion, you know, okay. 
anointing used to consecrate by anointing like they did kings, priests, right? Um, so you're gonna see that, but it's it's we're gonna show you in a, in another way that they use this word instead of saying anointing or anointed, we're gonna show you what this actually means. We're gonna look it up in the Strong's. Now let's go to Isaiah 61 and verse one. We're just gonna read one verse, and this is a good thing, but we're not gonna get off into the prophecy of it. We could, but that's not this class. I mean, so you get a chance, you need to read this, Israel, because you got some good things coming your way. You just got to hold on. Now, this is what Yahusha said when he came in the flesh. He said, the spirit of Yahuwah Elohim is, is upon me because the sovereign has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, which we know the meek is going to inherit the earth. He told you that, right? And in, in, in uh, Matthew, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, right? To proclaim liberty to the captives. Right? Because I mean, at this time, the brokenhearted was Israel. Right? The ones that scattered all over the place. Right? They didn't know anything about it. They forgot everything. And then even when you, if you want to look at the house of Judah, they up, they up under the Roman police. So ain't no different than it is now. You don't think they was doing the same thing to them? They didn't have no might in their hands. I mean, remember the remember the uh, the young men that took down the eagle from the temple. You see what happened to them to proclaim liberty to the captives, right? So they was captives, but just not only that, they was captive the Hasatan because they was under the law of sin and death and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Because I mean, we know that sin is a binding agent. Sin binds, you know what I'm saying? But the law sets free. We gotta understand that, right? To proclaim the acceptable year of, of the sovereign and the day of vengeance of our Elohim to comfort and all that mourn. See, so the I mean, so the acceptable year happened. He told him that arise and shine. Your king is here. John the Baptist went before him, saying, "Make way, make your path straight, because the king is on the way." And then he, we know that he's going to take vengeance. He's already taking vengeance on his earth, but he's going to do it. The day of Yahoo is going to be a very terrible day, right? But when we when we when we look this up, the word. He says, uh, the spirit of Yahuwah is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings. We see it's Strong's number 4888. Eight, eight. Let's go to Acts. Let's go jump over here to this new. We're going to get to the other thing. It's going to be a little bit later on, but you're going to see what I'm saying. But please believe me. Me and the brother, like I said, we was talking about these class, about this, this thing here. Some, and I'm not talking about him, but some people can't see the importance of dealing with this the priesthood and all the things that go along with it, but it's all, it's all about the Mashiach. He, he told you I came in the volume of the book. He all over this stuff. All of this stuff points to him. Every, all of it, everything. We gotta, I mean, that's something we gotta take, take in consideration. But if you don't understand, then some things might seem boring and draw it out, but please believe me, I mean, this is about our king. I mean, he can, he's coming, he's showing up in all kinds of forms. Let's see, let's look at this. How, uh, uh, Acts chapter 10 and 38, how Elohim anointed uh, Yah Yahusha of Nazareth with the Ruach HaKodesh and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of Hasatan. We just got them talking about how we was in bondage to the law of sin and death, right? We just and then that ain't the only thing. You also had the um the um book of the uh book of the law that was that's slapping you upside the head. Well, Elohim was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. Him Elohim raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before Elohim, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, right? And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of Elohim to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness and through his name, whosoever believe in him shall receive remission of sins, right? But you still got to do certain things, right? What do we got to do? We got to be obedient. We got to be obedient. And so this is what we have to understand. And this is how we retain grace too. We showed you that in many other classes. Like I just can't jump up because I go to church and say, I'm saved. That's not gonna, that's not gonna cut it. 
right? Now, let there be light, Genesis 1 and 3. So from this word light here, we see the word or, H number 216. It's a feminine now. Just like we looked up the Holy Spirit, it's a feminine now. So we know it's the Ruach. The Ruach is the light here. And the light is coming from the oil, as we pointed out. Number one, light of the lamp. Number two, light of life. Right? How's it light of life? Because everything she, I mean, I mean we, we can go to different books. It's going to tell you that she sits by the Father's throne as well. Right? And we know that life comes through her. How is that? How is that, Elder? Because she's the one that leads you and guides you in all truth. She's the one that comforts you. That's what the Mashiach told you. I got to go away so I can send you another comforter. And that's going to teach you and lead you and guide you in all truth. But you, if you don't have that, how are you going to know what truth is? Because you can tell because there's certain things that you don't understand. Light of prosperity, right? So this is where we get our prosperity from when we're obedient. Yeah, I'm not talking about no rich prosperity. I could care less about having material thing prosperity because the creator is showing you daily that that don't mean nothing. I mean, you got, <laughs> oh man, you got half the three, three quarters of the country covered with snow a snowstorm i mean it's just crazy and they're saying well see this is uh what they call it the um uh about the weather um i can't think of it right now this this fake name they use because they never want to give uh climate something some uncontrollable climate whatever they want to call it they never want to give any type of praise or any type of recognition to the, the one that created them but this so so but if, i mean when i look at this light of prosperity i'm thinking about the light that's going to teach me how to walk in the path so I can get eternal life, so I can be at the wedding feast. That's what I'm looking at. But this, this the Hasatan's prosperity with this material stuff, and you got to pay attention. You, if you've been paying attention to anything, you see that that don't mean nothing because trees is falling on houses, fires is burning up all this stuff. I mean, storms is mad, please. Light of instruction. It is, a, she is a light of instruction. You know why? Because she's the one that's telling you what you need to do. She's the one that's bringing these scriptures back to your mind. Why do you think you're doing all this studying and everything? It ain't for you to keep it to yourself. It's for you to take the light of instruction that she gives you and go out and help instruct somebody else. As teachers, that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's not about a, a title, or, you know, I'm a more or I'm a teacher, so what? It's not, I mean, you, you be, I mean, Yahoo does not give us this understanding to keep it to ourselves. We're supposed to be out here in these streets and up on this, on these channels, talking to folks, trying to persuade them, you know, or trying to help them be persuaded in their own mind why they need to be trying to do what the creator has commanded them to do. It's just that simple. That's our job. We're not supposed to be served. We're supposed to serve the people. We suppose that's what the word minister means. We're supposed to minister. We're supposed to come and take care of the people. When, when the Mashiach came out of the desert, didn't it say that the messengers came and ministered to him? So if you call yourself a minister, why is the people ministering to you? No, you I mean, taking care of you. No, you're supposed to be helping the people. That's what a true minister does. Exodus chapter 27, verse 20 through 21. Let's get this. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the uh, uh, pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. We read some of this in the tabernacle congregation without the veil on the other side of the veil, which is before the testimony, which is before the Ten Commandments. Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before Yahuwah. And it shall be a statue forever until their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. So this is supposed, so, and we know it stopped now, but we know these imposters trying to come up with all this stuff to bring it back. But then, see, that's what people got to understand. I mean, I'll be, I'll be saying, I'll be wondering, I was like, how do you fall into this trap? If you're reading the scripture, where the Mashiach at? Where's Zadok at? You know what I mean? But people get all like, oh, they, oh, they're getting ready to build a temple and they, they looking for the red heifer now. Who cares? Who cares? It's, it's key things, it's key people that I don't see, that I'm supposed to see with David at. Come on, man. Stop letting these people trick us with this stuff. That's when you're supposed to be getting, that's, that's when you know it's getting ready to really pop off is when, when, they, when they do that. How's the time going to make an appearance now? It ain't about, oh, wait, you know, we, we need to go to Jerusalem. No, you need to stay away from over there then, right? Now, let's look at, let's look at this frankincense. 
because we know that frankincense was brung to the Mashiach, right? Because frankincense is a very, to, even to this day, very, very expensive um, uh, incense. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 24 and look at this. But see, that's, that's our king. <laughs> if you even understood what frankincense and myrrh was, he would be like, you, that, that right alone gonna tell you. And you got these three, well, they said three wise men, but we know it was more than that. The, the book don't never even tell you, but we know at that time, just by doing history, just by understanding what was going on in the desert, you had bandits and all this type of stuff. I mean, cause you know, man is, I mean, what, what did the book say? From his youth, it starts as only evil continually. So they and ain't nothing new under the sun. So they 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 might maybe they didn't have guns then, but they had swords, they had daggers, they had arrows. They trust me, how's the time been 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 on this earth all this time? It was a lot of robbing and stuff going on. So you had to have basically like a caravan, especially if you had something that was worth uh, money or you had some type of precious cargo. And those wise men, being wise, they're not just gonna leave just three of them by themselves. Come on, man. They wise. They know better than that, right? Now, frankincense is the gum or resin of the Boswalia tree used for making perfume and incense. It was one of the ingredients Elohim instructed the Israelites to use in making the pure and sacred, pure and sacred incense blend for the most holy place in the tabernacle. So it was a blend. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. We're going to read verse 1 through 9. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, now, okay, we know here come a testimony. Here come an educt. If you don't know what that is, you got to go back into some of our other lessons, right? Uh, basically, if you don't know what a testimony really means, you don't know what an educt means, I, I urge you to go look at um, the, um, the uh, Book of the Law, uh, Book of the Covenant class. Now, and Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto the pure olive oil, right? Because we've been beating it for the light to cause the lamps to burn continue. Without the veil of the testimony, right? Because the veil of the testimony, we know that it was in the Holy of Holies because the veil, because the testimony of Yahuwah, the uh, covenant of Yahuwah is the Ten Commandments. And then what's attached to that to explain to you how to keep the Ten is the statutes and justice, right? This is what you need to do. If you don't do it, this is what's going to happen, basically. And the tabernacle of the congregation shall air and order it from evening until the morning before Yahuwah continually. It shall be a statue forever in your generation. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlesticks before Yahuwah continuing. Thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenths deal shall be in one cake. Thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row upon the pure table before Yahuwah. All right, because he's talking about the show bread now. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. Every Shabbat, he shall set it in order before Yahuwah continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of Yahuwah made by fire uh, by a perpetual statue. Right? So we got to understand that. So this is this. this so we, we're going to see that this uh, frankincense is not going to be on the table of showbread. Cause they kind of like the bread was in the middle of it. Like they didn't cook it with it and eat it. It was kind of like to dress it, kind of like to make it pretty. Like you know anybody that's ever been in the culinary, you know how you put how you it's like a, how you put something down and you might put something around it to garnish. That's what it base. That's what it's basically saying. All right, but it was important because you're gonna see this frankincense. It not only was beaten and they had uh, special things like stacky and all these things that they mixed for the incense, right? But they also, we see it here around the showbread. And I'm going to show you some, I'm going to show you how important this is. It was somewhere else inside the temple, right? Because here it's on the other side of the temple, right? It's on the other side of the Holy of Holies inside the sanctuary, right? But now let's, let's keep rolling. Now, myrrh. Myrrh is, is most known as one of the gifts along with gold and frankincense, right? Because we know that they brought frankincense, gold, and myrrh to the king. Right, the three wise men, and I and this is something I just copied out of this thing, but I just, because like I told you, I'm getting it out, I'll tell you what my source is out of this encyclopedia, men brought to Yahusha and the New Testament. In fact, it was mentioned in the Bible 152 times, myrrh was an important herb of the Bible, hmm? as it is 
It was used as a spice, a natural remedy, and to purify the dead. What? Yeah. Because that's what they buried the Mashiach in. They wrapped him in that. And we got to understand these things, right? All right. Now, let's keep moving. Uh, give me one second here. Something weird is going on right now. All right. All right, give me one second, y'all. I'm sorry, real quick. I'm hearing something that I'm wondering what's going on. All right. Okay. Now, let's do this here. John 19 and 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Yahusha, I mean Yahusha by night, and brought uh and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about a hundred pound weight. So this is what the Mashiach was wrapped in these in these different spices, but myrrh was one of them and aloes, and that's what they wrapped him in. Now we know the book said that his body didn't see corruption. So it it, it mean it, it never it wasn't stinking. But as, as according to uh, uh, Hebrew to the tradition, that's what they did. They, that's what they wrapped it in, so it keep the smell down. But again, he was a king, so he had this. He had these two spices, or he had this this, this spice when he was when he was a baby. They brought it to him, and his death. He's still showing you his power, and his might. But you got to understand, this stuff is some very very expensive stuff. So that tells me Nicodemus had a little bit of money too. We're going to show you this. Now let's look at this video. Frankincense and myrrh. Hold on a minute. Let me now. Uh, let me do this. Let me do this. Hold on, real quick, because I think I didn't do something. Let me make sure it's something real quick. Yeah, I know I didn't. Okay. Praise y'all. Thank you y'all for showing me that. All right. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Best known for their biblical connotations. But this tree sap has been prized across the world for over 6,000 years. These fragrant incense pieces come from the Bursaraceae family of trees and are found across the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. But despite recent attempts to protect these trees, they could soon be headed for extinction. So what makes frankincense and myrrh so expensive? There are roughly 550 species of Bursaracea, a collection of trees often referred to as the incense tree family, recognizable for their flaking aromatic bark and fragrant sap. But true frankincense comes from only a small fraction of those species. Frankincense is a milky white resin derived from Boswellia trees, which are remarkable for their ability to grow in unforgiving conditions. In fact, these trees have been known to grow out of solid rock. Myrrh, on the other hand, is a reddish resin extracted from Comifora trees. The process of extracting sap from Boswellia and Comifora trees is virtually identical. Incisions or taps are made in the bark of the tree, which create injury. The trees produce a gummy resin, like a scab, as a protection against the injury. The resin then hardens into teardrop pieces. More incisions are made at important intervals to continue the production of resin exudates. The resin granules collected from the trees must be separated into different grades. First grade A frankincense is clear, white and without impurities. Smaller pieces of the same high-quality granules are separated within a sieve and classified as first grade B frankincense. The grades gradually deteriorate based on the size and the amount of impurities, such as bark infused into the resin. Low-quality frankincense is mainly sold for local market consumption, whereas grades 1, 2, 3 and 4 are exported. 
صبو موزي قدامه اي يبهل زي بدرجو اون قدامه اي بواغو اون زحشو واغا يزلو مالتي بتقميت لي هذا الناتر بين هذا الناس بقى واغو اون قدامه اي زي لا على واغا لو قدامه اي بهل مالتي كاب 10 5 شهر نغوص ابزي 10 5 شهر شي شو من تم ايتن 10 5 شهر شو من تم ايتن بزي باتو نغوص ابزي عاد مالتي that means that at wholesale, this sack of first grade A Ethiopian frankincense is worth about $430. Frankincense and myrrh have been burnt as incense for thousands of years, and both are deeply ingrained in religious ceremonial burning. Yeah, see that? In fact, it's estimated that the Roman Catholic Church alone still uses an estimated 50 metric tons of frankincense a year. Frankincense and myrrh were some of the most highly prized commodities in ancient civilizations and became the driving force behind the creation of the incense trade routes, a vast network of major land and sea passageways dating back to 300 BC that linked the Mediterranean to luxury goods from the south. At the height of their use, these routes allowed the transport of approximately 3,000 tons of incense every year, hauled by camels. Today, alongside its medicinal and cosmetic uses, frankincense has found a surge in popularity as an essential oil which in its purest form can be sold for as much as $6,000 per litre. Frankincense essential oil alone generated more than $190 million in 2018, and that's expected to exceed $406 million by 2028. But with so much money to be made from damaging a tree, the tapping process, which should happen only two or three times a year, is under threat not only from environmental dangers such as wildfires, but also from local untrained tappers. It can sometimes take decades for these trees to start producing resin. So the sustainability of the species relies on injuring the tree without killing it. Unfortunately, the harvesting process uh, of uh, frankincense is very damaging to the tree. So every time people go there and make wounds and then collect the, the sap, that doesn't give enough time to rest for, for the tree and heal itself. So one of our findings is this tree is uh, really under a threat. The International Union for Conservation of Nature categorised the Boswellia sacra species as near-threatened over 20 years ago. And the lack of over-harvesting laws in some countries means that protecting Boswellia trees in such remote areas is virtually impossible. Experts who surveyed ageing Boswellia papyrifia trees in North Africa suggested that most hadn't produced a young tree in half a century. <laughs> Let's move on. All right, uh, come on now, don't do me like that, let's go. All right, now, <clears throat> the gift of frankincense is said to have been an acknowledgement of Yasha's priesthood, right? Because you gotta remember, he was a king and priest, right? He is a king and priest, right? He's a king and he, he's a uh, high priest under the order of Melchizedek, right? Setting him apart from a typical king. And in my opinion, I think the wise man understood this. Frankincense was used in a temple routine, burned ceremonially by the priests. So that's why this stuff is so important to understand. Exodus 30, 34 through 38. Then Yahuwah said to Moses, take for yourself spices, stacti, and anika, and gabanum, spices with pure frankincense. There shall be an equal part of each. With it, you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting. Boom. Where I will meet with you, it shall be most holy to you. So this is so this frankincense, this, this, and, and then this mixture is a most holy mixture. So we go to the Psalms of Solomon. Uh, chapter four and six, until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now, John 19 and 30, 38, afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Yahusha, 
but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Yahushua. But you got to remember, he was a, uh, I think if I'm, if I'm right, I'm thinking um, he was afraid of the Pharisees. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who we know was a Pharisee who had previously camped to Yahushua at night, also brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. So they took the body of Yahushua and wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices, according to uh, the Hebrews' burial custom. I don't like to use that word Jewish because, I mean, even though at this time they was taking over everything, they had, um, what is it, Psalms, um, is it 86, 88? Um, was telling you, or the 80 was telling you that that's what they wanted to do was take over the temple, and they did. But anyway, let's keep rolling. Now, uh, we see that these different things. Now, here is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, sometimes you're going to see these Ark, and they're going to have all these items, you know, the manna, Aaron's rod, all these things. They're going to have that inside, but it's not, that's not even right. They was never inside. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16 show you this because you see these pictures all the time and they always had this like, like that like this stuff was inside of there no it wasn't it was not inside the only thing that was inside this ark was the testimony right exodus chapter 16 verse 33 through 34 well i'm starting at 32 and moses says this is the thing which yahoo commanded fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations right but he's talking about the man. Well, let's, let's go to uh, verse, um, verse 30. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like a coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And they didn't even want that. They was complaining about that. And Moshe said, this is the thing which Yahuwah commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generation that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt, right? And Moshe said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before Yahuwah to be kept for your generation. As Yahuwah had commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept, right? So he laid it up before the testimony. So when we look at that word before, Right, we see um, a strong number G1722 in or how because we know the word E N N is, is, is talking about uh, like when she actually says, I'm gonna be you will be in me like I am in my father, or we say the word who or how or it means among, among that or in front of in the same location as this is what it's saying. It wasn't inside, it was in the same location as. So we got to understand that it's laid up before or in front of the Ark of the Testimony, not inside. Now, we just got done reading Exodus 30, 34 through 38, but we'll do it again. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, so we, we see these things, right? In front of or before is where these items were at. All right. Let's go look at this. We already read it, but I'm going to read it again. That way you, 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 you got to clear in your mind while we're looking at the picture. Now, Exodus 30, 34 through 38. And Yahuwah said to Moses, take unto the sweet stack, te anik, uh, an, ayin, cha, garbum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be a like weight, and thou shalt make it a perfume of, uh, confection after the art of the apo, um, apothecary tempered together, pure and holy, and thou shalt beat some of it very small and put it, uh, uh, put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation. What I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. So we just got done looking at the video. Here, here's the incense holder right here, right? Where you think the Catholic Church get that from? They were swinging it right before your face. This is what they, this is where they get this from, right? Because you got to remember, the Pope calls himself what? The Vicar of Christ, the replacement. But he, he's an imposter too. Let's keep rolling. Now, we're going to stop right here. When we start again, we're going to go through the first fruits. Because I told you, I'm going to break these things down uh, uh, one thing at a time, a section at a time, in small bites, so you'll be able to get it. When we get, when we start, I mean, every type of offering, we're going to break it down in small bites. 
So it's going to be a lot of these little videos connected to this series right here, but they're going to be quick. And that way you can go back over them, back over them, back over them until you have it in your mind. So the next thing we're going to put up here for part four, we're going to talk about the first fruit offering. We know this, there is a feast of first fruits, right? But we also know that the people were supposed to do, so it was something that they was commanded to do with the first fruits of everything that Yahuwah gave them that come out of the ground. They were commanded to do something with that. And we're going to look at that the next time. So uh, without further ado, I just want to say thank you so much for coming up here. Um, again, I just, my spirit just put on my mind to do these classes like this. So they're little short classes. And uh, again, if you want to go over them a couple of times to really get the understanding of everything, then it's going to, it's going to help you out a lot. Because when the last classes we had, people were struggling a lot with this. So, I mean, spirit just put it in my mind just to cut them up in little sections. That way it's not too overwhelming and it's not too much information at one time. Because a lot of people don't really, haven't really studied uh, this part of the book as far as the Levites and the tabernacle and all these things. Stuff is very important. And these offerings are very, very important. Again, because guess what? They, each one of them, <laughs> you can see the Mishiak in them, shadow pictures of him all over the place. And we're going to show you that each time we come up here. So let's pray. Ab Yahuwah, we thank you so much, Father, for your kindness, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for uh, helping me with this class. I hope that, uh, Father, you touch the people so that they can understand what's going on with these classes. And it's going to help them draw closer to you. So we thank you, Father, for all things. In Yahusha's name. All right, y'all. I just want to say thank you for coming up here. May Yah shine his face on all of you, right? Uh, uh, so again, with that, we say shalom.